Can you hear me okay? We're all spread out, and uh, which is a good thing nowadays, uh, but it really makes it challenging to make sure that everybody hears what's going on. So how many of you guys believe that God is here moving in our midst and working among us? Just clap your hands if you believe that. I believe it with all my heart. It's what we just got done singing in that song, Waymaker. We believe that he's here, that he changes our lives, that he, that he works in us as we follow him to make a difference in our, our lives. And because of that, I, I believe that anyone can lead a life of beauty. I believe that anyone from the, the richest to the poorest, from the most powerful to the least, from the most educated to the least educated, can lead a beautiful life. The series is intended to help us explore that very thing through the story of a young boy, really a whole family, but a young boy named Samuel. So let's pray and we'll jump right in the text this morning. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word. Shape us through your perfect word preached by an imperfect person. You are here, Lord. We worship you. Please do your work among us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there's this old story, and I'm going to start off by saying, I don't know if it's, if it's even true, but it's a good story, so I'm going to share it with you today. So this story takes place over 150 years ago, during the time of Tsar Nicholas I the emperor of Russia. And it revolves around a young soldier, a young soldier who had joined the Russian army. And his his father, his father was a good friend of the Tsar, so he got a, a really cushy job in the army. He was put in charge of all the accounts, all the finances of the Russian army. He would handle the payroll, he would handle the 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 ordering of supplies, the the requisitioning of of uniforms and weaponry. He did all that, and and all the money that paid for that, that belonged to Russia, and through Russia, the Tsar of of Russia, would pass through his hands. Now, you would think somebody with that job would have a, a really good grasp of that job, would be really good at it. You would think that, but you would be wrong. He was, he was not good at it. In fact, he had a, a, a pretty bad gambling habit. And you would think if he had a pretty bad gambling habit, he'd be good at gambling. But he wasn't good at that either. He lost in cards regularly. And he, he very quickly ran out of his own money. And so he began to use, in the safe that was kept behind his desk, the money entrusted to him to pay for all the things the Russian army needed. And over the course of some time, I don't know how long, he managed to spend an incredible amount of money, which would have been okay, except for, at some point, the Tsar, Nicholas I, decided that he needed to do an accounting of money spent. And so he sent a letter to this this Russian soldier and said, hey, in in about a a couple of days, you'll be getting a, a visit from the person who will be doing the, uh, the checking over the books. Everything better be square. And so that young soldier sat down at the table and began to go through the accounting books. And he realized very quickly that he owed more money than he could ever possibly, ever possibly pay. And he, he got to this point where he was so deep and, 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 and into despair and darkness. He didn't know what he was going to do until you, he happened upon a solution in the, in the darkest moments of his life, the only solution he could think of. And he, he grabbed his pistol and he determined that he was going to kill himself. And as he sat looking at that pistol in the darkest most despair-driven time of his life. That's the only thing he had to look forward to. 
And so he, in order to work up his courage to do that, he decided he would wait until midnight. And at the stroke of midnight, he would take his own life. We'll come back to that story in a little bit. You got to listen to the whole sermon. It's like a cliffhanger. It makes it more interesting. <laughs> he was in this place that saw no hope. A place of despair, a, a dark hole that threatened to swallow him with no chance of getting out. Have you ever been in a place like that? Maybe there are things that you've done that have put you in that place. Maybe your life is in a place right now where you never thought it would be. You had high hopes, you had high dreams, but you just never quite gotten there. Maybe when you were younger, you, you thought you would be in a completely different place. But a couple of bad decisions have put you in a place of hopelessness. Or, or maybe it's, it isn't that dark. Maybe you are exactly where you thought you would be. Maybe you've crushed it. You've knocked it out of the park. You've achieved everything you set your mind to achieve that you thought you would achieve. But you have this, this nagging sense that it isn't enough. On your worst days, you think, is, is this it? Is this all there is? Are you stuck thinking, what do I do now? You may not be looking down the barrel of a pistol, but the same sense of hopelessness and dread hangs over you. How do you find the hope for a beautiful life in that? You may have heard the name of this series and thought, yeah, right. What kind of fantasy land is this? And in the midst of that kind of feeling, that kind of turmoil that takes place inside of you, there are a number of reactions. Some people give in to the despair ultimately killing themselves. The darkness and despair is so great that they can't see through it, can't see hope on the other side of it. And by all accounts, it seems like that number, is, that number of suicides in the United States is going up. During the last several months, because of hopelessness and despair during the coronavirus, it seems like those numbers are trending up. If you are in that place right now, please hear me. You don't have to give in to it. There is hope. You may not see it, but there, it's there. Just reach out and talk to somebody. Talk to me. Talk to anybody that's here. Another reaction is just to trudge through life. Grit your teeth and just get through life. Just empty of all joy. Everything becomes just duty. Just pushing for, through life. No joy. Some people just give themselves over to just thrills. There's no joy in life. Everything's so dark and despairing that you just get every pleasure that you possibly can out of life. Hoping to drown out the hopelessness. Some, grow, some people grow cynical. And sarcastic, yeah, right, they say, a beautiful life, whatever. What are you smoking? Those are all attitudes that can come up. But it all comes from a place of despair, of hopelessness. You may be in one of those places right now. Or somewhere in between. If you are, I want you to know that there's a different way. A way that avoids all of those things all those things that can carry us into despair and hopelessness, all those. And so there's three points that I want to I want to go through today. You could you could call these like headings and an outline, but they're not really. They're just three questions that are going to loosely guide us as we look at this text today. The questions are this. Do we know our purpose? Do we shape our lives to that purpose? And do we yield our hearts to that purpose? And I want you to hold those questions in your mind as we look at how they play out for the people in our text today. 
Do the people in our text today, do they know their purpose? If you had to guess, what would you say, yes or no? Do they know their purpose? Yes, they know their purpose. Both, if you look at the sons of Eli and if you look at Samuel, they know their purpose. And I'm going to unpack that here for just a second. Because the sons of Eli, they know their purpose. It is to serve God as priests in his house. They are the ones to come before God on behalf of the people. It would be hard for them not to know it because it's, it's based on their birth. It's based on them being in the family that they are that is, because, that is part of the priestly line. From the, the moment they're born, they are going to serve God in his place at some point. It would be hard for them not to know their purpose. They are the ones tasked with offering gifts and sacrifices to God on behalf of his people for their sins. Their purpose is to serve as a mediating presence between the holiness of God and the rebellion of the people. This is clear. Now we see it over and over again. God's holiness is such that it sweeps away anything that isn't holy. One of the most powerful examples of this in all of Scripture, I think, is found in Isaiah 6. Isaiah is, he has a vision where he is in the throne room of God. And he writes this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, ho God, Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Isaiah is undone. He is lost. He knows that his state of being unclean in the presence of God's holiness will sweep him away. And he's afraid. And if it weren't for the, the mediation that we see with the angel, he would be done. This is the experience of God's people. That is the purpose of the priests whom God has picked. If you look at Numbers 18, 5 through 7, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it. You, are to, you can turn there if you like, but you can read it later. You are to be responsible, talking to Aaron and Moses, you are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar, so that my wrath will not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of meeting. But only you and your sons, meaning descendants, may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. God has set aside people to serve so that his wrath won't fall on his people. It's an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome purpose. So you see, the sons of Eli, they know their purpose. They are the sons of Eli, a priest. And they are priests. Samuel did too. Samuel knew his purpose as well. He was... He was acutely aware of it. Probably very painfully aware of it. And it takes a little bit of work to see that. 
But if you just go into the story, you can see it. He had been removed from his home at an early age, soon after being weaned, and given over to the service in the house of the Lord. Samuel, of any other people, would have felt that. Every year he would have been reminded of this when his mother would visit with the robe that she'd made with her own hands to give to him. This is one of those passages in Scripture that makes my heart ache. It is so bittersweet. Can you just imagine that? One, giving your child over at a very young age, and one, being the child whose mom had nursed him for three years probably, maybe a little longer, the first voice he would have heard, he would have bonded to her. He would have had attachment to her and then to be given to service at the temple. And then that achingly sweet longing that he would have had and felt every year as that time for his family to come and visit, to worship. Every year he would have felt that, that, that achingly, achingly sweet longing. That bittersweet reunion full of gifts and love. And then the pain of leaving each year. So he knew what he was given over to. It would have been a constant pointer pointing him to what he had been set aside to do. The cost of what it was to pursue service in the Lord's house. He would have measured the pain of loss against the service he gave to God in Shiloh. They knew their purpose. Do you? Keep holding that question. Are our lives shaped to that purpose? Were, were their lives shaped to that purpose? So they knew their purpose. But there's a world of difference between knowing something and actually letting that thing shape our lives. And this is where we begin to see a contrast come into play. The sons of Eli are supposed to be serving as priests. They know their purpose. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But it isn't what they're doing at all. They're serving themselves. They are feeding their own appetites, fat from the offering, which is forbidden in Leviticus. Sex with the other servants of the house of the Lord, food and sex... It is made abundantly clear in this passage that they are abusing their purpose. That is what the whole first six verses of that passage are, are telling us. It's revealing to us just how wrong these priests have gone. And not only do we see how they act, we get a picture of their mindset in verse 17. Verse 17 says, This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt to have contempt for something is to think nothing of it if you hold a person in contempt the bottom line is you just don't think that they rate that they don't deserve the time of day i'll pause for just a second So the reason I pause there is because I've been told that people can't hear when those bells are going off what I'm saying. 
It's the longest, like, 20 seconds that I know. <laughs> to hold a person in contempt is to think they don't deserve the time of day. When you are in court, if you disrespect the judge, they will hold you in what? Contempt of court, which means they find you guilty of having no care or concern for the authority of that court. That's where these priests are. No care, no concern for the authority of the king. Samuel has the same path. He knows his purpose. He doesn't know exactly where it will take him. And we see that a little bit later on. But he's faithful to it. We see in verse 18, the but word. So the, the priests, are in, they're contemptible. They, they aren't respecting what their, their purpose is. But Samuel was ministering. He was serving before the Lord. And in contrast, he shapes his life accordingly. He walked his purpose faithfully, serving God. We don't see how. We don't learn a whole lot. We just know that he did. And we see in verse 21 that because of that, he grows in the presence of the Lord. He experiences God's favor. But the sons of Eli, they face the consequence for what they've done. In Eli's rebuke of them, found in verse 25, Eli says, If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. They faced death. Many people will balk at that. They won't like those words, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. But look at what they've done. They have turned away from their purposes. And they've turned into sin, and now they face judgment. The consequences of their actions come back on them. We don't get a lot of insight into that with them, except over and over again in the Bible, we see how God relates to the actions of humans who show contempt for him. And it appears that over and over again, these priests have been abusing their position. And now God has judged them. And they are cut off. You see the contrast there? Samuel, who finds himself in the presence of God, And Eli's sons who are now cast out into death. No longer to do the the very thing they're supposed to do as priests. To go into the presence of God on behalf of the people. And God has raised up another priest. The boy Samuel we are told in verse 26. We're told he continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. But let's go back to the question that Eli asks In verse 25. Because that question just hangs in the air. If anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? It just hangs there for a long time. Because the answer is no one. It hangs there because it's a rhetorical question. Eli doesn't expect an answer. No one Any offense against God leaves a person bare before the mighty holiness of God who holds the cosmos together. Phineas and Hophni, the sons of Eli, they forget that if they ever even believed it. They hold it in contempt. We forget that. We forget that sins aren't judged by the damage they do to other people. They are ultimately judged against the holiness of God. Every sin is ultimately an offense against God. And we have gotten into a place where we justify so many things with the statement, well, it doesn't really hurt anyone. 
and we forget all sins offend God. If anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? The question just hangs there. So right here, if this sermon ended now, right here, the answer to the question, what is your purpose? The way you answer that question, if the sermon ended here, the application of this sermon, if it ended here, what is your purpose? Based on what I've talked about for, for the last however many minutes, might be something like, you better make sure you don't do anything wrong. You better make sure you give to the poor. You better make sure you treat everyone with dignity. You don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't disrespect your parents. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't, 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 don't. You may walk away thinking you have to try as hard as you can, you, you can to do everything just right. Because if you don't, God is waiting in the wings to smack you down. That is a popular view of God. That's what people think that God is, waiting to smack people down in the church and in culture. I can remember, I used to, when I, we lived in Tennessee, I would preach at all these different churches because I, I would just travel around and when I first got started. And any church that needed a substitute preacher, they would, they would let me come in and preach. And I remember we were at this one church one time, and uh, we had been in the, the pastor's office, and I'd walked out, and my wife was still in there. And a lady from the church who didn't know my wife came in, and she started looking for the drawers, through the drawers of the desk, of the pastor's desk. And my wife's like, can I help you? You know, do you need some help? She didn't know her. They didn't know each other. And the lady said, yeah, I'm looking for my cigarettes and my lighter, but don't tell the preacher. And my wife's like, okay. So she helped her look. Never told her that she was the preacher's wife, but in her mind... She thought that if the preacher didn't know what she was doing, she was okay. Because she viewed, like, she viewed that if she could just hide the things in her life from the preacher. It's a fear of God smacking her down. It's what people in our culture think, too. They think that the, what we believe is just that this God is waiting just to crush anybody who does anything wrong. And then, of course, they clearly see that we do wrong. And they label us hypocrites. And if the sermon ended now, that's what you'd be left with. Except there is an answer to Eli's question. The answer is related to verse 26. If you've read enough of the New Testament, you might re recognize the verse and the wording in that verse in verse 26. Turn to Luke chapter 2 if you have your Bible with you. Luke chapter 2 is a very interesting story. It's a story of Jesus, a young Jesus. He was 12 years old. And his parents go to the temple to worship. I'm giving you time to, re to turn there and wait on the bell bells. <sighs> so just read Luke chapter 2, <laughs> verses 41 and following, <laughs> while we wait for the bells.
So Jesus' parents have taken him to the temple. They go up there to worship. And they're on their way home. It must have been a big caravan. They look around suddenly and they realize that their son is not with them. They thought he was with some other people in the caravan. And so they turn back around to go to Jerusalem to find to, to look for Jesus. And this is what Luke tells us happened. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And here, here's the thing. Here's the verse. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. A mirror image of the verse that we saw in verse 26. Jesus understood his purpose, and he lived it. He sought to be with his father and serve his father. Who can intercede on our behalf? God himself and the son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was in the father's house, Jesus, who served his father perfectly in a perfect relationship, comes to the father on our behalf and asks God to forgive us. As he hung on the cross. Samuel replaced the sons of Eli when sin cut them off from God's presence. Jesus substitutes himself as the object of judgment so that we can serve. So that we aren't cut off. But so that we can grow in the presence of God. The young soldier in the Russian army, remember him? He's sitting there, he's holding his pistol. He decides that he's going to end it all at midnight. He looks at the account book, he writes these words, the debt is too big, who can pay? And as he waits for midnight, he grows tired and he drifts off into a fitful sleep. And as he sleeps, the story goes, Nicholas the first, the Tsar of Russia, has gotten there early and he decides to hold a surprise inspection himself, not through an emissary, but himself. And he sees a light on in the office and he, he goes in and he sees the young man asleep. He recognizes him as the son of a friend. And he looks at the accounting book and he sees what the young man has done. He sees the money wasted. And thinking to call the guards to arrest him, he is suddenly seized with a powerful sense of kindness and he grabs a pen and he writes something in the book and then leaves. Later that night, the young man, he wakes up from his sleep and his eyes fall to the book. And written after his question, who can pay, is one word, Nicholas. The only one with the ability to pay back what is owed is the one to whom the money belonged. The next day, his emissary shows up, not to inspect, but to bring the money and pay what the young soldier owed. And he's taken from the depths of despair into a new world of hope and delight. And the story goes that the young soldier, out of gratitude, served faithfully and well for the rest of his life. Who can intercede? Jesus. What can take us out of hopelessness and despair? What can give us purpose? What is our purpose? Yield your heart to him, to Jesus, the mercy and grace of God through Jesus Christ. Turn your eyes to him. Yield your heart to him. Let him shape your life, and it will be a life of beauty and purpose. I don't know where it will take you, but you'll find it. I promise. Pray with me. Lord, help us to yield ourselves to you. Help us not to think of the, 
the question of who will intercede for us, but to, to, to concentrate on the answer, and that is you, that is Jesus. Help us to sink that deeply into our hearts so that we do not become bitter, so that we do not live in despair, Lord. Save us. Help us to live lives shaped by that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.